Welcome to the ANZOGS uh, webinar series on using behavioural science at the bad end of town. We've got um, a great talk for you today. Um, I'd first of all like to acknowledge the First Peoples. We have participants from all over the world at this webinar, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging First Peoples from our, all of our countries and pay my respect to them. We honour their wisdom and their stewardship of traditional lands, waters and customs which enrich us all. Welcome to you all. I'm Janine O'Neill, Principal Behavioural Scientist in the Queensland Department of Environment and Science. As someone who's firmly committed to advancing the part that we play um, in behavioural science in regulation um, and adding that to our toolkit, I was absolutely delighted to be invited to facilitate today's webinar. So I'd now like to call on Femke to tell us why and how regulators need to make better informed and more frequent use of insights into behaviour. Femke, on to you. Thank you very much, Janine, for the kind introduction and hello, everyone. Good afternoon for you. Uh, good morning for those who are joining from my time zone. It's an honor to uh, to contribute to this uh, ANZOC webinar on how to imply behavioral science to improve the effectiveness of, uh, of regulation. And we'll share some insights with you in the next uh, 15 minutes or so on how you can apply behavioural science to actually get a grip on the effectiveness of processes in the supervised or regulated uh, entities. And let me share some slides that will be made available also to you, like Janine said before, uh, after the webinar. Well, let's start with this uh, this nice picture, and some of you may recognize this athlete. It's uh, Elliot Kipchoki, and over a year ago he achieved a major uh, achievement since he ran the fastest marathon ever in Vienna, I think it was, under two hours for 42 kilometers. Um, but the international Athletics Federation did not recognize his achievement as a world record since the conditions were, as they put it, too ideal and therefore not realistic. And you may recall, those of you, you who've seen the race, that during the run there was this green laser beam at the street to point out the ideal track for Kipchoke to make sure that he wasn't running uh, too many meters. Uh, and also he was assisted by 42 um, top uh, runners. You see some of them behind him in the, in the black shirts. They assisted him to keep the necessary schedule and to, to keep the pace that he needed to, to actually achieve the, this uh, record time below two hours for the 42 kilometers. But because of the circumstances uh, didn't reflect um, the real world, as the IAF um, put it, uh, the world record time wasn't recognized. And I think we all understand uh, why. Uh, but the strange thing is that when we look at um, processes in organizations, we often pretend that our employees or regulated entities work in ideal conditions, while we all know this is, of course, not the case in, in real life. And what struck me uh, during my years as a regulator that we always assume that when a process is designed, people will act as you expect. Well, I think we all know when you work at a regulator or a regulated entity that reality is, is different. Um, so when we really want to to get to know the effectiveness of, of processes and when we really want to build upon processes in regulated entities, I think it's key to understand behavior. And we know from the Nobel Prize winning work of Richard Taylor, for instance, that we all take shortcuts in our, our minds. Uh, you're probably familiar with the work of, of Taylor. He has done uh, a lot of work, as has Daniel Kahneman, of course, um, on the biases, so the behavioral pitfalls, the shortcuts people take in their minds. And I think this this picture shows it, it tells it all. Whenever we get a chance, uh, we take a shortcut, and it's not because we have bad intentions, but it's because of how our brain 
works. So we are not complete rational human beings, uh, although we want to, to behave uh, like good citizens in regulated entities. Also, we take shortcuts because of complex processes, because of unclarity in rules, and of course, sometimes because of uh, commercial drivers or all other kinds of drivers you can think of in your uh, your area of regulation. Um, but the interesting thing is when, when we look at regulated entities, we often do not take this mental or um, sh shortcuts into account when we look at processes and we when we assess, for instance, uh, how processes work in regulated entities. So getting to know um, how the brain works and using the behavioral science to actually assess processes in regulated entities is, I think, key for the effectiveness of regulation. As we uh, know from, from all this work in, in behavioral science, and, and I think the Paul Janine just showed also shows that you have been working with this kind of insights already in your regulated entity. From all this work, we know that although we have a design, well-designed process, uh, there is no straight line between the process and the behavioral outcome. And that reality is in fact more like the lower uh, picture, so a well-designed process and then a lot of fuss uh, and hopefully uh, coming to the right outcome. But when regulating a certain, um, a certain area, I think uh, realizing that there is no straight line between the process and the desired uh, outcome is, uh, is key, especially of course when regulating at what ends or gold the uh, bad end of town. And I will give you some examples of how to apply behavioral insights in uh, the anti-money laundering area. I think also in your financial sector, but I think all over the world, banks and other financial institutions or um, companies working in the in the financial sector have been working very hard to uh, become more effective in in fighting money laundering and corruption for instance um, there there is a huge societal uh, importance of having these processes uh, in place if effectively. However, every time it turns out that um, people within these processes behave different uh, differently than expected. So when you look at this kind of processes, for instance, uh, anti-money laundering processes within financial institutions, but I can imagine that this also applies to, to tax compliance or whatever uh, kind of regulation you're responsible for, you see that within organizations there are a lot of biases in place. So these mental uh, shortcuts, sh uh, shortcuts we take in our brain to um, make reality more easy easy and to be actually uh, able to work in this complex reality. We take this, this shortcuts and of course they're also very much influenced by the corporate culture in, in organization, but also they're influenced by the actual um, work of the regulators. So part of this is also influenced by the regulators and I think becoming more aware of the uh, unintended consequences also on behavior of our regulatory um, focus is I think an important thing uh, to do. So I think Janine just mentioned that uh, Enzo will share an article I wrote about unintended consequences of regulation. I would recommend uh, that article to you as well because um, in this article, I, I explain how uh, regulation itself and the behavior of regulators will influence the uh, behavior within organizations. Well, getting back to these biases in internal processes, what you see here on this slide are a few example of hum examples of human biases in organizations. And I, I guess you will recognize them also in your own organization. So people are afraid um, for, to, to lose what they have. So this is called loss aversion in, in psychology and, and um, behavioral science. I'm not going to take this risk. I might get a negative performance review if I do so. For instance, in anti-money laundering processes in regulated entities, 
we um, we count on countervailing power within this organization. So compliance picking up to the first line or the business to make sure that uh, customers that shouldn't be welcomed in the in the organization aren't welcomed. Uh, in fact, but when people are afraid, of course, to speak up in an organization because of loss aversion or maybe because of social norms in organizations, this will influence the effectiveness of the process. So this is to show that um, also when we design a process that is in theory uh, very effective, we have to take into account how people behave within these processes. Um, I will not go into all biases, but maybe at the uh, right hand corner, so the lower right hand corner, you see the law of least effort, and that was of course visualized in the picture I showed you before. In organizations, people want to work safely, uh, but if it takes too much time or the, co uh, the process has become too complex, they will probably cut corners. So being aware of where people deliberately are um, unconsciously could cut corners is is key, I think, to actually assess the effectiveness of a process. And then I would like to take a look at uh, the effect of outsourcing, for instance, because what we have seen in a lot of organizations also in the anti money laundering uh, area is that parts of the process are being outsourced, not uh, outside the organization, but within the organization in various regions or various parts, departments of the organization. We've got a front office, we've got a back office, we've got compliance. So we involve all different kinds of parts um, of the organizations. But as we all know, that uh, is that outsourcing or cutting a process in in pieces does have a behavioral effect. And um, well, I, I guess you will recognize part of the uh, biases that, that are mentioned on this slide. So as soon as people experience a loss of control over a certain process because part of it is outsourced, uh, they will also, that will also have an effect on the level of ownership they feel for the outcome. So outsourcing a process will definitely, and also psychological research shows it does, it will have an effect on ownership and probably on the quality also of the outcome of the process. So outsourcing may have an effect on the motivation to be committed to actually perform what you have to do. Um, it may also lead to in-group favoritism and probably we are, I think, a few hundred uh, people in the audience right now. If we will, uh, if we would divide you in different groups and give you an assignment, you will probably immediately feel part of your own group and have a sense of in-group, out-group feeling towards the others. And this is what also happens in organizations. So even if the, if the process is designed to work together uh, efficiently and effectively with other other parts of the organization, then there could be this sense of in-group, out-group favoritism or in-group favoritism in an out-group feeling that will actually hinder the um, cooperation in the organization. And I, can, I think you can imagine all kinds of different examples in your own practice as well. For instance, those guys of the IT department, they never understand eh, what we want to have. They make things too complex or those guys at the HR department, they don't understand the business. So I think we all have from our own experience various examples. So taking these kind of effects into account is essential to uh, to be able to design an effective process, but also to assess as a regulator the effectiveness of processes. And I would um, I, I would like to underline don't uh, underestimate the effect of outsourcing. So don't only look at outsourcing from the lens of effectiveness and, uh, and cost reduction. And then, of course, uh, when we 
when we look at the um, the specific bad end of town kind of regulation, so the biases in relation to customers, when you look at large financial institutions, but I'm sure that uh, you all got um, various regulated entities that, that encounter the same kind of challenges. When you look at AML and uh, uh, fighting corruption, people have to assess the trustworthiness and the background of their clients. And um, what often happens is also when assessing uh, other people or the trustworthiness of people, our mind makes certain shortcuts. So imagine the situation when where you have this client who you've, you have been working for for over 20 years. You think he's a very nice guy. You've never seen any problems or um, any bad, uh, bad situation in, in his um, context. That this will probably cause the, the halo effect. He's such a nice guy, I'm sure he would never break the rules. Um, a similar effect is the, the affinity bias. Uh, so when we see similarities in, in a client or someone, someone who we have to assess, and we probably have a completely different view on this person than we when we look at a very uh, someone who's very different from us. Also, I think we shouldn't underestimate the cognitive strain. So when people have to perform a task, uh, especially in, uh, in, in assessing uh, information, large uh, amounts of assessing information, uh, people tend to make shortcuts as well. And we know from behavioral science, when we have to perform very complicated tasks, that actually the amount of brain power we have diminishes. So uh, this can also cause people taking a, a shortcut, uh, like it says here, I'm going to find a more efficient route. How important can this small piece of information be? Let's just put it aside and make sure I get the assessment done. And of course, this is especially uh, the, the case when people are under a large amount of, of pressure. Well, um, how do we use, how can we use um, this perspective, the behavior, this behavioral insights perspective in, in the regulated uh, area. Well, what we see is that regulators often build upon the effectiveness of, of processes without taking this human behavior in, um, into account. And due to the fact that people are not fully rational actors, I would like to underline that taking the um, the biases or the behavioral pitfalls into account is essential for truly assessing the effectiveness of processes in regulated entities. Uh, so don't have unlimited confidence in, in the working and the effectiveness of process and try to understand the behavior. And I will share before I uh, finish because I see Will or um, Will take over in, in a minute. Um, I will share a, a method you could use to um, to assess the behavior of, of, of people within a process. When you apply behavioral science and knowledge of human behavior to what we call a employee loop, uh, and you do this for various players in a certain process, then you can get a very um, insightful view on how human behavior actually work in this, works in a certain process. So what you see here is a engagement loop. The idea stems from uh, gamification because of course in games we're tempted and encouraged to keep playing and to play by the rules and also to work together even with players in our team that we don't know. So when you apply behavioral science to this employee loop, uh, look at the motivation of people, the actual resources they have, the rules they have to work with and work uh, within, and the amount of feedback and progression uh, that is made uh, available for them. You can actually get an insight in how people have to work and where the behavioral pitfalls are. Um, and this is an example. Um, there's too much uh, information, I think, for you on the slide to uh, to digest now, but this is to give you an idea. The red uh, 
fields are of course examples of where the employee encounters friction and obstacles in his organization when performing his tasks. For instance, when you look at the right hand side of this picture, you see that, for instance, in anti money laundering processes, we see that uh, processes have become very complex, rules change very often. And we also see that there are different guidelines for employees that have to work within the same process. And you can imagine that this will lead to, uh, to friction and uh, flaws in the process and also a lot of rework and, um, and mistakes. Well, to, um, to, to end my, my introduction on applying behavioral science, maybe one insight in how you can apply nudging then to, to solve the frictions you have found in this core em um, engagement loop. What we have seen is that applying nudging, for instance, in a anti-money laundering process will, um, will improve the, uh, the collaboration, for instance, between teams. What, you've seen, what you see here is a situation where teams had to work together in different time zones, not knowing each other, not knowing each other's name, not knowing if they'd worked together before uh, on a specific file. And what we did with this nudge is actually to re redefine the identity of the team. So to make it more salient, uh, who are in the team together with you? Um, have you worked with this team uh, in an earlier stage? How successful have you been? And what is actually the status of the file you're working on? Well, there are a number of examples where you can use nudging and behavioral science to actually solve the friction in, for instance, anti-money laundering processes. Uh, I will be happy to, to share more, uh, more of these examples with you. Um, but maybe some, some final um, closing remarks. Um, incorporating behavioral science can really improve your approach to regulation for, and also can make it more forward looking because by applying behavioral science, you can actually identify flaws in the process, friction that people may encounter and that may lead to the fact that the outcome is less ideal uh, as you expect it. Uh, we see a lot of uh, regulators experimenting and also learning together with the supervised or regulated entities and also publishing results of this um, of this experiment. And I think that's really a, a good practice. Uh, we can uh, only, I think, make progress when we share good practices. So hopefully this uh, short introduction has been an invitation to do so. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have uh, after Will's uh, talk. Thanks Janine and, and Femke and, and hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you this evening. You've heard from the introduction that, that I have a lot of involvement with other agencies, other regulators, law enforcement agencies, uh, other departments both. Uh, domestically, both Commonwealth and state, and also internationally, and that's one of the great pleasures of my of my working life, as well as a you know a really effective um, compliance strategy. But I'm here mainly to talk to you from that uh, ATO perspective. So again, you've heard in the introduction, I'm the deputy commissioner for integrated compliance. So I sit within our client engagement group, which is predominantly broken into particular client experiences, so individual small business private wealth, public groups and international. And that and those other lines have a real focus, I guess, on the end to end of supporting willing compliance. And that can look like um, education, general education through to specific, uh, specific advice, through to public and private rulings, through to uh, active, proactive engagement uh, in terms of um, you know, major transactions right through to assurance around the big end of town around their tax governance uh, and their tax results, as well as ultimately the, the more traditional audit uh, sort of perspective. But my, my take's a little bit different. And so I, I really do focus on, on behavioural um, impacts that, that might impact on the integrity of the tax system. So I particularly focus on more complex arrangements 
uh, more consequential, so have a bigger impact on the integrity, as well as those that might have a degree of, I guess, taxpayer culpability or have the potential to. So, so that's where I guess even on that simple kind of structural sort of angle, we do look at how do we, uh, within the ATO, how do we best support willing compliance right through to how do we bring a spectrum of behaviour, a uh, spectrum of responses to deal with, with behaviours at the at the pointier end as well. Um, I'll say up front that um, uh, FEMC has already talked about uh, anti-money laundering. And again, one of my great pleasures is working with other agencies, but it's also working on public-private partnerships. So we've done quite a lot uh, working with Austrac and with the Fintel Alliance uh, in Australia around how do you how do you actually help indicate fraud to help those banks report um, su suspect matters? I'm not going to go into that um, in detail today. I'll also say up front, I kind of regard myself as a sort of pre-prepared audience member today. I'm, I'm not standing up uh, at all as the experts around as the expert around um, behavioural science. A bit like we've already seen in those survey results. Certainly, we do use behavioural um, science sometimes and probably like most agencies here wouldn't mind to use them a little bit more. We probably have a fair idea what motivates compliance but would love to know even more and so I'm certainly hoping you know to even learn from the questions and from and from the other experts on the panel. I'll say just as a as a light aside I was reaching out to some of the uh, my programs that report to me to say have you got any thoughts on, on what I should share around behavioural insights and, and one of my programs came back and said, no, but we've got, we're attending an ANZOG um, meeting on, on Tuesday afternoon and we hope there'll be lots of answers there. So it's a sort of life imitating art, but it certainly emphasises to me, we have an interest uh, very much in this topic, but, but not pretending to have all the answers. And, and it's great through this sort of regulators group that we can, we can have some of those conversations. Final thing I'd say in terms of context, again, as the principal revenue collecting agency of the of the Australian government. That's obviously been our traditional and very much our, our predominant um, role. We do have regulator roles when it comes to things like self-managed super funds. And of course, through the economic stimulus packages that we are now administer, we've come a very, become a very significant payer of money as well. So I guess our, our regulatory kind of interest is, is quite broad now, not just in collecting, but also in in fairly paying out monies and, and I'll touch upon some of that as well. Um, so we know that most people do the right thing and pay the right amount of tax at the right time, but equally we know that we don't collect all that is owed. And I guess the, the alpha and omega of our compliance approach is really through considering our tax performance and, our, and really what we call our tax gap thinking. So the ATO has just recently released the final parts of its full suite of tax gap estimates and we did that in October this year with the release of five new uh, tax gap estimates. So these are gaps that, that where we look predominantly through the income tax kind of lens of that individual small business private groups uh, public groups kind of analogy as well as we look at some of the transactional tax like GST luxury car tax. Uh, and excise and, and we try to estimate, okay, what have we collected versus what is the theoretical kind of maximum amount that could be collected? And a couple of kind of direct links to what Femke has already said. I mean, she's, she's spoken about needing to, to publish results and inform social norms. And again, there is a behavioural element to, to this publication in part to inform the public about what the actual size of non-compliance is and there's a lot of public debate and a lot of social feelings about that and we know that uh, public perceptions of um, the big whether the big end of town pays the right amount of tax can impact on compliance in the at the lower at the individual kind of level as well so what we try to do is really inform that that public debate the other side of it, i think is um, you can really if you get trapped into just measuring your like audit results or your activities um, you can actually have a distorted view and you actually end up kind of um, almost um, no answer to that perennial question of are we getting better at finding poor behaviour or is there more of the poor behaviour? And I think that's the sort of perennial regulator or law enforcement kind of question. And, and it's through the sort of analysis of what is the gap that we can start to 
do a few things, as I say, the alpha and the omega. It, it can set what is our overall performance to, to inform public debate. We can then measure our tax gap over time to see if we're having an enduring kind of impact in, in improving compliance or in reducing that gap. So that starts to say, are we having success or are we just getting better at auditing, uh, for example? Um, and then by really delving into what are the drivers of that tax gap, it can actually inform what should our best strategies be. And again, behavioural science will, will certainly be part of the, I guess, the balanced diet of potential responses that we've got. So very broadly speaking, we do think about how can we improve willing compliance? And so we will publish a gross gap. So that's the sort of the how much tax is paid before active ATO in, intervention. What's the kind of level of willing compliance? And again, we're not naive here. We don't, you know, assume that that's exuberant and ecstatic compliance, but it's, you know, people comply to a certain point. Uh, and then we look at what is the net gap. So even after after our interventions, um, you know, what's the amount of tax that's paid compared to the theoretical 100%. We don't expect that we'll ever get to 100% because, you know, there's not enough resources on on the earth, uh, you know, to to enable that. But we do try to say, what can we do to, to nudge or to shift or to help willing compliance versus that, uh, you know, how do we intervene effectively? So publishing uh, our gaps helps uh, and, and really understanding that the drivers of our gaps helps to inform us where we put our resources in. So just to give you a little bit of detail, um, our latest work shows that the overall gap for the 2017-18 financial year is about 31 billion, which is about 7% of the total amount of tax that we'd collect if everybody was fully compliant in a, in a theoretical sense. So in, in world terms, uh, we're doing really well, um, but we do want to improve and we know behavioural science can help. So for example, as part of that overall gap, we estimated the individual's gap. This is um, people like you and I, uh, how much of that tax gap comes from us? And we, we estimate that to be around 8.3 billion or 5.6%. This is individuals who are not in business. Now again, how do we get under the bonnet of that and really monitor that and really understand what was driving it? So we looked at work-related expenses claims. Now some of those are inadvertent, some of those are deliberately making wrong claims. And so we think around 4.4 billion or, or half the total gap for individuals is driven by work-related expenses claims. So we did look at how we could use behavioural uh, science and behavioural nudges uh, to impact that. So, for example, in the 2019 tax year, so just over 12 months ago, um, we sent out nudges online as people were using my tax to about 220,000 taxpayers. Um, and we nudged to basically a pop up message saying, what you're claiming or, or purporting to claim seems to be out of step with your peers. Um, and so the majority of those um, nudges, those 220,000 odd nudges related to work related expenses. And that led to overall a reduction of about 76 million in terms of those work related expenses claims. So again, pretty low cost, um, something that had an impact on a lot of people, probably a lot of people, a small amount to make them more compliant you'd probably say probably didn't make anyone less compliant. So effective in that kind of sense. Um, again, I've already touched upon social norms, but we certainly do look at how do we how do we engender that feeling of, of a sense of pride and, and probably well known, but for example, the uh, income tax assessments when they're issued actually uh, illustrate to people where their tax money has gone towards welfare and, and healthcare and education and so on. So they get an idea of of what their, what their tax money um, goes towards. Um, on top of, again, so I guess my key point here would be behavioural science certainly improves our compliance approaches. It's the only um, thing we think about. Um, so we'll often say you can't audit your way to success, which is why we look at data, which is why we look at behavioural science. Equally, you can, I think, audit your way to fail. You need to be a real and, and you know present issue in the marketplace, uh, you know, the, the cop on the beat. However, you need to couple that with the full range of levers. So maybe the, in, in the interest of time, one way of kind of illustrating that is thinking about 
uh, relatively recent role um, in a range of government stimulus measures that were announced and enacted in relation in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've had um, responsibility for a, a large number of um, uh, economic stimulus measures, predominantly what's called the job keeper payment, which I'm sure you're aware of, as well as the cash flow boost. And that's getting up towards about 100 million payments. So 100 billion payments, I should say, $100 billion in payments um, already over the, over the last six months or so. So it's a very significant program. Now we used sort of strong messaging at the outset in terms of encouraging people um, to do the right thing. So we also reached out directly to, to tax professionals, uh, to various taxpayer groups, particularly on that social norms to really plead the case that people follow both the, the spirit and the, the letter of the law, um, given the, the, the national crisis we were in because of the pandemic. We also used a nudge approach for taxpayers who were risk of, of applying for payments, but potentially not meeting the, the various requirements. So there was, a, for example, in relation to JobKeeper, there was a necessity to have a, a decline uh, in turnover. So we, we started by nudging people who we thought potentially wouldn't be eligible. Um, and that was really designed to get them to reconsider their eligibility, so to check for errors in their application um, and or all, and all to contact the ATO to discuss potential overpayments uh, or if they were no longer eligible. Um, I guess therefore in nudging them, we were uh, trying to take it as an opportunity to, to, to educate um, to, to encourage them to think about their self-assessment process. Once they had been identified, did they want to continue with that self-assessment? Did they want to seek further clarity or a confirmation from us as well? Um, we also designed the system as much as possible to not allow applications that were ineligible. So for example, for those, uh, it was a requirement that you'd uh, lodged your 2019 business activity statement. So we actually went out, out of our way to contact those that had not lodged. So you, you won't be eligible unless you did lodge. Um, and I think we found about 45% of those that we contacted actually um, you know, lodged their BAS in order to, to get to that el eligibility um, requirement or question. Um, we also used, I guess, insights from, from various other programs that, that we had designed to come up with a range of new um, risk models. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, that, that included some, some backup risk models that we designed through the Fintel Alliance to have financial institutions give, a, give us a heads up if they thought um, you know, there was suspicious uh, activity around some of those payments. Um, but we also used a range of our internal um, uh, risk models and developed some new ones. And finally, we did a lot of data matching. So we knew, for example, uh, Services Australia was obviously um, administering Job Seeker, and we were looking for double claimants. So for employees who were who were on Job Seeker, also had employers claiming Job Keeper for them. So some of that data matching is another, you know, huge part of that, I guess, of that um, balanced diet. So just thinking of time, um, I might just touch upon a few other areas. Again, it sounds a little bit like a, a selection of a menu, I guess that goes towards the, the balanced diet kind of point, but it also goes to the point that others have raised that you know, we're experimenting um, with some of these, some of these opportunities uh, and certainly hoping to learn more from others. So the, so the black economy is one area that we do pay particular focus on. And again, going back to that tax gap thinking, when we look at the small business tax gap, a lot of that is driven by black economy activity. Um, and so that's where we've used the uh, TPRS, which is the taxable payments reporting system. So what we've done there is to try to um, encourage data to come in um, on, from verifiable third party sources to help us to manage, I guess, a black economy risk in particularly non-compliant industries. So very conscious of time. So I'll just quickly conclude in saying, um, I think having an end-to-end -end measure and an end-to-end -end approach to managing compliance is critical. Considering behavioural science at all levels of the behavioural spectrum, I think is important as part of that um, balanced diet. Um, and if, as I said before, if for no other reason, if 
if behavioural science can move a lot of people's compliance even a little bit and not make the compliance of others worse, it can improve the, uh, the overall system and certainly complement that broader range of compliance approaches. So I might leave it there, Janine, and, and hand back to you and for questions. Thank you very much, Will. That was covering a lot of really insightful information. Um, we're going to go to questions now. You'll see me looking down. I'm, I'm not playing Candy Crush. I'm actually looking at the poll, um, the Q&A of questions coming through. There's a broad array, so I'll just get on with it with um, the time uh, also front of mind. Um, so uh, Femke, um, are there any before and after evaluations which might demonstrate whether greater use of BI has had a favourable impact on regulatory effectiveness? Over to you, Femke. Thank you very much, Janine. I think that's a uh, rele very relevant question, of course. Do we do we get effect when we put an effort in applying behavioural insights? And what I know from the uh, financial regulators, they've published quite a lot of these kinds of experiments. Uh, also, um, showing that that certain interventions have not been effective and I think we can learn from those kind of uh, experiments as well. So I know that both the Authority for Financial Markets in the Netherlands and the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK have published various um, results of experiments where they have applied behavioural science, for instance, in the Netherlands uh, a research has been done on the effectiveness of a cer certain credit warning that turned out not to be effective. And I think it's a uh, yeah, it's a good practice also to publish where you have tried something and it's turned out not to be effective because other regulators can, can learn from that. But uh, yeah, maybe we can share uh, with the slides some examples of, um, of research that has been published. But when you take a look at the FCA website and AFM in the Netherlands, you will definitely find some very interesting uh, research. Femke, are the psychological biases exhibited by regulators toward duty holders exacerbated by, recru by recruiting from regulated industries? Yeah, I think that that's a good question as well. Well, uh, overall, I think, uh, of course, there, there are two, uh, two different uh, perspectives to look at that question. There's always the question of, um, of, 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 uh, people at regulators getting too, too close to the regulated entity. So the regulatory capture, um, the danger of regulatory capture. But I think on the other hand, there is a large value in knowing what really happens in regulated entities. And since we discussed that, and we don't, um, we shouldn't be naive as to the effectiveness of processes, for instance, or on how people work together within regulated entities. I think it's essential also that regulators have at least part of their staff has experience in the regulated uh, sector and really knows what what is going on in the regulated entities. And of course, you have to be aware of the the danger of regulatory capture. But I think we have uh, developed some procedures like rotation and countervailing power within an organization to mitigate that that risk. And also, I think um, there was another question I saw in, in, in the Slido. Um, of course, also within uh, regulators, we need behavioral uh, science expertise to actually mitigate the biases that, that may be present towards the regulated sector. Um, or within the regulated, uh, within the regulator itself. So I think uh, debiasing for regulatory capture is is of course important, but uh, being accepted as a regulator also demands knowledge from the uh, from the regulated uh, sector itself. I think so. A mix would probably be be best. Thank you, Femke. Um, a question here, and we'll start with you first, Will, um, but it is to both speakers. So do we think a bit more public shaming around non-compliance with tax obligations might be helpful? And does this work? I, I don't know that I've done um, uh, a lot of research on this uh, in terms of, of sort of naming and shaming, Janine, but I'd certainly go back to my earlier point that I think publishing actual kind of results uh, is important. I don't think um, that it 
is as simple as a as a regulator, you know, publishing results and showing that you know the, the degree of tax performance is is necessarily easy. I think there's a there's a lot of kind of social norming or or faith based kind of beliefs in the big end of town doesn't pay the right amount of tax and and it's it's us little people who who are paying it. In fact, as I've said, some of the some of the gap analysis actually demonstrates a different story. Um, I don't know whether naming and shaming actually would be a, a good driver um, as such. However, certainly, you know, there is that that full suite of kind of activity that I mentioned. We do take criminal action. We do bring down the full um, force of the law in appropriate circumstances. And I think that can have a, uh, you know, a, a specific deterrent to the, to the individual, but also a, a general deterrent to others who might um, participate. But, Femke, you probably know more than I do on this topic, so I'm happy to defer to you. Thank you, Will, and I think I, I agree. Um, and I think when, when looking at naming and shaming, it, it's it's important to also look at who, who you're focusing on, because I think that from research uh, in the area of naming and shaming, we know that it's only effective uh, towards company that really have companies that really or entities that really have the ambition to be a part of society. So um, I would say those who have a reputation to lose are, I think, um, um, vulnerable to, to naming and shaming, but those who have no reputation to lose, lose or do not value their reputation in, in society. We have also seen that, for instance, in environmental regulation. And so large uh, corporates uh, probably value their reputation and are afraid for naming and shaming, but, um, but others are, are less. And uh, in general, in, in regulation, when you look at naming and shaming, I think it, it has only limited effect uh, to uh, uh, on, on the choices of customers. And we often think that while naming and shaming, this will also affect the choice of customers, so they will not do business again with a company that has been named and shamed by the regulator, but uh, in real life, the effect of uh, naming and shaming on the behavior of, of customers is uh, is very small. So uh, whenever as a regulator you want to achieve um, this um, voice or choice behavior of, of uh, consumers, I think you have to follow a different strategy than naming and shaming. Thanks very much for that, Femke. And I think it's an area and a conversation that comes up quite often in regulation and it is about you know what is the likelihood that this is going to get us we have tried other enforcement action what can we do so that was a really um, great insight from you thank you moving on to another question it's got quite a number of votes here so I'm going to read that one out um, Femke I'll start with you and then ask you the same one Will does ongoing engagement with regulated entities make a positive difference to compliance or does it risk the regulator looking soft Femke Oh, I, I, I don't think it will. Uh, it does have the risk that the regulator will look soft because uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, applying behavioral science will make regulation more intrusive because it gets closer to the true working of uh, processes in organizations. So I think the, as the International Monetary Fund put it after the crisis that uh, regulated entities really have to feel the presence of the regulators and I think applying behavioral science will will contribute to that feeling because uh, as a regulator you get more uh, if you like under the skin of the regulated entity when you really look at how do how do things work within the regulated entity and how do people behave so we if we um, zoom in uh, and, and not, um, not not take the, the design processes uh, for granted. I think we will even become more intrusive as, as regulators than if we don't. So applying behavioral science, I would say under country, uh, it won't uh, make the regulator look uh, soft, but even more intrusive. Uh, from my perspective, Janina, again, and we've probably uh, I've already indicated that that getting uh, particular audits or particular um, criminal prosecutions is is an important kind of aspect of our compliance approaches. 
but it's certainly not the only thing. And, and I think if you're as a regulator entirely looking for gotcha moments of look how many people we've caught, you can ultimately reach a tipping point where people actually start to think, well, if you're catching that many, the whole game must be, you know, a bit fraught or a bit corrupted. So, uh, you know, what we've tried to focus on is again, the full range of kind of interventions, but at times actually working with particularly large businesses on their uh, on their governance processes, really not looking for an audit outcome to say, hey, look, we've raised X dollars, but actually looking to assure ourselves and the community that they're actually paying the right amount of tax or that they have good governance processes in place. I think that that's a positive kind of message as well that again should give uh, as much public confidence. So again, not saying we don't look for for audit results, not saying we don't even look at criminal prosecutions, but that's not the only motivator. And we think getting in and actively engaging with people rather than making us look soft actually gives an assurance to the community that's, that's valuable as well. Thank you very much. I'm just going to read out a couple of things and then probably just ask for closing comments. Um, there was a recommendation here that people might want to look at The Art of Thinking Clearly by Rolf Debelli. Um, if you are interested in reading more about psychological biases. So um, that's Rolf Debelli. Um, Femke, there was strong interest in um, you providing more examples to people. So I don't know if there's an opportunity to do that in something that you might attach to this. Um, and um, because that was of high value. I might just, because I'm conscious of time, um, closing comments, um, Will first, please. Oh, well, I did come on board to learn. I think I already have learned, so I'm, I'm as, as keen on picking up books, uh, references like that and for and for Femke's um, additional thinking as well. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great debate for us to be having is, is, what, is what I would say. And Femke? Yes, thank you, Janine and, and Will also. Well, I think there there is still an enormous uh, amount of work that can be done in, in regulation and I would like to underline it's also trial and error, so don't be afraid as a regulator to to experiment uh, together with the regulated entities and to see uh, what works and to uh, share all kinds of good practices. And, and maybe one final remark, uh, currently in the Netherlands we have this parliamentary inquiry after a tax administration that was biased towards fraud detection and um, and, and implied there was a lot of fraud amongst people who who were actually uh, working within the rules and, and a lot of damage was, was done in this situation. So I would like to stress the importance also to keep looking at our own behavior as regulators and uh, to, to constantly be aware of the possible unintended consequences of key performance indicators and this kind of steering because we have huge and, and, and extensive powers as regulators and, and have to be very careful in applying them to, um, to the public, especially in, in fraud detection.